we are currently in the midst of a, of a big crisis, the coronavirus crisis, and a lot of the talks um, in, in the general public, in the media, is about drugs and, and medicine. What should I take if I think I have COVID-19? Um, what should I take if I have COVID-19? Um, you've done a lot of work um, on drugs and the use of legal drugs in our societies. And you're actually a strong advocate of less drugs, uh, legal drugs in our societies. Could you, could you tell us actually what's, why is it so important that people realize that in a way, taking drugs could actually make you more ill than not taking drugs? Yeah. Okay, Frank. Um, the issues are, uh, as you say, at the moment, people want to know what to take. They're looking for things that will work to treat COVID. But in actual fact, they really need to also be asking the question, what should I not be taking? What are the drugs that I'm currently taking should I not be taking? Because most of us these days are on other drugs. Very few of us are on no drugs at all, the way we would have been 30, 40 years ago. There'd be lots of us who are taking no drugs at all. Now, if you're over the age of 45, 50% of people are on three drugs or more. And if you're over the age of 65, close to 50% of people are on five drugs or more. And a lot of these drugs are drugs that people don't need in the sense of they're not treating an illness. They're treating healthy people who your doctor has persuaded you, look, you're at risk. Take a drug to lower your cholesterol levels. You know, now that's not an illness. Most of the people who are on these drugs won't have a cholesterol level as high as I do. But I wouldn't take a drug to lower my cholesterol level. And particularly at the moment, the problem is a lot of these drugs that we could be on from antidepressants to painkillers to all sorts of other drugs may compromise our immune system to make us more vulnerable to catching COVID. And the other thing that they can do is that they can compromise the body's ability to fight back if we get COVID, making us more likely to get a pneumonia. And when you look at the people who seem to be dying, it's older people and particular people who are in residential homes who are on a whole lot of drugs. Sometimes it seems just to keep them quiet rather than to treat an illness. And this, these are issues that need to be looked at a bit more. And people need to be asking, why am I on all these drugs? Why is my mother or my father on all these drugs? And what are doctors going to do about it? Now, it can be very difficult to do things right at the moment, because a lot of these drugs that people get put on, you can't get off easily. And it is important not to alarm people too much. But after all this is over, there are going to be serious questions about, did we put people at risk of dying from COVID when they didn't need to die from COVID because of everything else they were on? So in your opinion, um, why are all these people, I mean, are most of the people on drugs that they shouldn't be on? Well, part of the issue here is that we've begun to view drugs as being harmless. And drugs are no more harmless, in fact, a lot more harmful than viruses and germs. On average, the average drug is a poison, uh, you know, which we used to use them when the condition a person had was pretty serious to the point where we figured, you know, well, actually, in the ordinary course of events, you don't want to take a poison. But in this case, we can maybe turn things around that the risks from the condition are worse than the risks from the poison. But as I say, for the last 30 or 40 years, we've got into a position of treating people with mild hypertension or people who are mildly anxious or a little bit of bone thinning or whatever with poisons when they don't stand to gain, when the chances of things going wrong from the poison are greater than the chances of things going wrong from the condition that we're treating. And this becomes a particular problem when you're not just putting a person on one drug, but when you've got them on three or four or five drugs. And is it down to the doctors, uh, the GPs in, in England, for example, or is it down to someone or something higher than that? Then it's then. a combination of things. One is that uh, the pharmaceutical industry can get drugs 
on the market without showing the raw data from the clinical trials to regulators or to politicians or to doctors. Now, doctors have too easily swallowed the line that these drugs just do good and that they can't do harm. They've forgotten that they used to know once upon a time that these things can be harmful and that you need to weigh things up and really work out should I be taking these risks or not? And the other thing is, they used to know what the risks were. So 40, 50 years ago, if I put you on a drug, I'd have known what the risks were and I'd have been able to tell you, look, this is what you need to watch out for. Now the literature that they read in the very best medical journals is ghost written by pharmaceutical companies. It's not written by the professor of psychiatry in Oxford or Harvard or whatever. Their name may be on the article, but they won't have written it. It'll, it will have been written by the pharmaceutical company and it will hype the good things about the drug and it will hide the harms. And that's, I mean, you can't, you can't blame the average doctor, I guess, where, well, it's hard to know how much to blame the average doctor when they read articles in the very best journals. It's a bit like reading things in the Bible, you know, you believe it. If it's in this journal, you believe what it says. At this stage, Doctors should be at a point of figuring, well, actually, you know, I've been hearing that a lot of these things are ghostwritten and there's no access to the data and probably more doctors should be asking questions about, well, how reliable are things, even if they appear in the British Medical Journal or the New England Journal of Medicine? I mean, this question and, and what you just said is quite shocking, right? The, so you're telling me that the regulators will be presented with a drug, uh, the pharmaceutical company would have had trials, etc. And, and, but the regulators won't have access to the full data, right? That's, That's right. So in a way, they, they, read, yeah. they read a report about what the data says prepared for them by the pharmaceutical company. And the encouragement from the politicians is for the regulators to partner with our friends in industry. Now, that's fine. Part of what the regulator depends on really is that Doctors like me, when we then use the drug and find that I give this drug to you, Frank, and it causes awful problems, that I put my hand up and tell the world that, hey, look, this drug can cause a problem. Trouble is, we've got to a point where industry can control the media so much that if I leap up and down and say, look, this drug can cause problems, no one hears me. And no one even wants to hear me anymore. So... Oh, um in a way, I mean, it, it seems quite quite simple, right? If I am a pharmaceutical company, uh, my my goal is to make more money, more profit, and I'm making more money by selling drugs and by making sure governments agree that these drugs can be uh, usable. And I'm also the one writing uh, in medical journals, etc. So, but I mean, so you know this, you know this is happening. Uh, I guess a lot of people know this is happening. And it seems wrong, right? So why why is it still happening? Is it lobbying? Well, it's a very interesting question. The people who make the guidelines in the UK and the chief medical officers in the UK and all know it is happening. But they say, what can we do? This is a profound political question. What can we do? And I think one of the things the public may be asking at the end of this COVID crisis is, well, hey, you know, what are our politicians there for? What are the senior medical people there for if they're just turning a blind eye to this? I mean, if they know it's happening and they're just washing their hands. You were talking about, in a way, the, the day after, uh, just, just before, and saying there's, there's a lot of questions are going to need to be raised. Uh, we know this about so many issues. I mean, I was reading an article that showed that if neoliberalism and vulture capitalism they sort of didn't destroy uh, health services and hospitals, we won't be in this situation. In a way, we could have dealt with the virus in quite a mild manner. So this is obviously one question. You, so do you, I mean, but the thing is, is it going to happen? Are we going to ask these questions when this is, up, this is over? Because these are crucial questions, right, about massive failings of, of society yeah. and politicians. Sure. And we're only going to ask the questions if the media are able to make the public aware that there is a question like this to be asked. Now, 
the media are saying, look, we need to ask questions about neoliberalism. They're happy to talk about that. This is a question that the media are not talking about. And, uh, you know, it is one that does need to, be, need to be raised because unless it's raised, no one is going to be asking questions when the crisis is over. But don't you think that for the media to talk about something, uh, a lot of the population and the public also needs to be pushing the media to talk about these things? So what about starting with educating, I guess, the, the mass of the people to... Yeah, the but the people that are going to do that have to be the media. It's going to have to come back to the media. At the moment, a lot of the mainstream media uh, get told by uh, the politicians on either the right or the left, we do not talk about the hazards of medical treatments. We do not want to scare people away from treatments. Now, I'm not trying to scare people away from treatments. What I'm trying to say is you cannot blindly just take what they're telling you for gospel truth without scrutinizing it. And the values of the person getting treatment need to come into account also. Their judgment call cannot be replaced by the judgment call of their doctor, nor of the senior medical politicians, and nor of the Minister of Health either. People's values count. So, um, so you think that the role of the media is, is crucial in this? I mean, is it more crucial than the role of politicians? Do you think the media should be the one, in a way, influencing politicians to change this? Or? I think the media are key in all this. And unfortunately, the, for, um, uh, 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 the pharmaceutical companies and, and you know, the politicians have got very skillful at manipulating the media saying we don't want a false balance. You know, we've got a lot of experts here saying these drugs work wonderfully well and this is what you should be doing. You know, we don't want to have people out there trying to scare people away from treatments. Uh, so, and this, this has meant that a lot of the mainstream media like uh, the BBC and liberal newspapers like the Guardian, for instance, will not talk about the hazards of treatment these days. And the tricky thing is, I mean, so the key thing is, do you trust people's judgment or not? Or are you in the business of trying to tell people what they should be doing? And I guess a lot of the politicians really want to tell you what to do rather than to trust people. Okay, I, I land sort of now with a final question. Because it seems to me, I mean, um, I've had people, for example, in my family that have suffered from depression and stuff. And when they leave the doctor and they go to the drugstore or the local pharmacy and they leave with a pretty much a shopping bag of drugs i mean i've, I've seen this to friends and family and stuff they know it's, it's wrong i mean they, they even sort of joke about it they go look you know i'm back from the pharmacy and they've got sometimes 40 50 60 pounds worth of drugs but in a way you know the the problem i guess is that authority and when you see a doctor you know the white blouse the, the the title it's very hard for people to go against it right to go to your doctor and say doctor do you really think i should take all these drugs uh, so even even though we feel that it's totally wrong so how can we change this public perception as well about drugs in our society yeah We've, we've come within healthcare to a tipping point, which is rather like the, the environment. It's great to have cars, it's great to have things that work and to be able to do things, but there comes a point where you have too many cars and too many factories and you cause the, uh, the environment to degrade. In the same way, it's great to have pills. I am pro pills. I want pills, I treat people with pills. I don't say you should be treating yourself without pills. If you've got an illness, I use pills. But we've reached a tipping point, which is people are now on too many pills. And what we need to get back is a sense that for the pills to work best, less is more. That you get 
the pills working better if you're on fewer pills than if if you're on three or less than if you're on five or ten or more. And lots of people these days take ten different pills. And I don't mean ten different pills of the same kind of pill. I mean ten totally different drugs. And they may be taking three or four of each of those, so they may be on twenty or thirty pills a day. You know, we need to get back to people only be on the drugs they need. And that's, I mean, yeah, there's, there's, there's been a climate change in healthcare, just as there's a climate change worldwide. And uh, people's life expectancy, even before COVID, had begun to fall in the Western world. And probably the single biggest thing we can do to try and turn that around is to get people aware of the fact that less is more, that you need to only be on the pills you absolutely need, and not on everything your doctor or some pharmaceutical company suggests to you that you might need.